thank you, Jennifer, and uh, thank you to Salvation Army uh, for inviting me and uh, for the hospitality. When I was in West Nyack uh, last year, it was a very warm welcome, and uh, I really enjoyed my time there. Um, I will tell you a little bit about myself and then uh, get into my story and, and talk about why I do what I do, uh, why I talk about child abuse and with such passion. Um, I am uh, a pastor at, at a church in Somerset, Pennsylvania, so uh, I came this morning, just an hour and 45 minutes. Um, I have three beautiful children, uh, a beautiful wife. We've been married for 15 years, so not quite as long as you guys, <laughs> but we're, we're ch chugging along. Um, I'm a certification specialist with GRACE, uh, Godly Response to Abuse in the Christian Environment. Uh, so I do trainings across the nation for them as well. Um, and I have to read my own notes because I forget what all I do. Uh, I, I podcast. I have a weekly podcast called The Speaking Out on Sex Abuse Podcast. Uh, I do that with my mom. So uh, that's a, a, a joy to get to spend time with her. And we pick on each other. And it's, you know, we talk about heavy stuff every week. But um, it's nice to have a partner in crime. Um, I blog fairly often on my website. Um, I'm not very creative, so it's just my name, jimmyhinton.org. Um, and uh, I need to add to that, too, uh, that I'm also an author. I just finished my first book, which is a memoir. Uh, it's called The Devil Inside, How My Minister Father Molested Kids in Our Home and Church for Decades and How I Stopped Him. Um, and so that is kind of an introduction to my story. Uh, that book will come out in January of 2021, so uh, it'll, it'll be released very soon. Uh, in 2011, on July 29th, my youngest sister at the age of 21, uh, she scheduled an appointment to come talk to me in my office at the church building, and she said, I have something to, to talk to you about. Uh, I could tell by her tone, uh, it, it was something very serious, uh, and she needed to speak with me very quickly. Um, I scheduled an appointment, she came into my office, and with trembling hands, she handed me a piece of paper. She sat down across the desk from me, she buried her head in her arms, and she began to weep. I read, uh, it was an email correspondence between her and another young, uh, young adult, and they were describing a night where they were both sexually abused by my father uh, when they were very young children. And my sister said in the email, do you, remember, do you remember that this happened? I had forgotten that it happened and I'm starting to have memories coming back. I need to know if this is my imagination or if this really happened. And the response back was, yes, I remember. I thought I was the only one. Uh, in that moment, I had to figure out a whole lot of things. Um, it's hard to describe how your world comes crashing in on you so quickly and how you have an instant identity crisis. Everything I thought I knew about my father, who I loved and adored, uh, I went into ministry because of him. Uh, we were best friends. And in a second, my world changed. And I looked at my sister, Alex, and I said to her in that moment, I believe you. And I said, I have no idea what, what our life is going to look like from this point forward. All I know is it's going to change. It's going to change dramatically. Everything else is unknown. And we're living in a time of unknowns. Jennifer and I were just talking about that. A, a lot of the anxiety that people are feeling, a lot of the depression, a lot of the anger, a lot of the injustices, a lot of that is fueled by so many unknowns that we're living in right now. We're living in a time of unknowns. And I looked at my sister and I said, I, I have no idea what's going to happen from this point forward, but one thing I can promise you, it stops now. That was a Friday. Um, I, I had a wedding rehearsal an hour after my sister disclosed that to me. I went to the wedding rehearsal uh, to my church members who were bubbly and happy and excited and and I was dying in a pile. Um, I made it through the rehearsal. Uh, the next day was the, the wedding. Uh, after the wedding, we were at the, the dinner, 
We had a sign seating at a round table. To my left was my wife, to my right was my sister Alex, and across the table from us was my father. Um, I made it through the wedding. Sunday morning I woke up and I did what pastors do, I preached. And in the front row, or two rows back actually, sat my wife, my sister Alex, and my father. Monday morning, my mom and I were, were in the police station, the local police station at Somerset, reporting my father, having no idea how many victims he would have, having no idea if he was currently abusing. Um, we, we just didn't know. But we did the only thing that made sense. We reported him. And what I talk about, what I'll talk about today is, is part of you know, how abusers think, and, and that's a, an important part of resisting the devil, right? Because James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. I think that sounds nice, that sounds like, a, like an important verse, and we want to rah-rah that verse, but the problem is if we don't know how the devil thinks, we will have no idea how to resist him. And I want to give people tools in their belt so that they can know how to resist the devil. Because the devil is smart, and he's calculated, and he doesn't look like the devil. He blends in really well. Uh, Jennifer used the word this morning, chameleon. You know, abusers are chameleons. We had no idea my dad was abusing. Not only victims in my church, I would find out, up to the point of his arrest. But he was abu abusing some of my siblings under the very same roof. We had no idea. No idea. None of us did. So I want to give you some tools to equip you um, to be able to stand up and resist evil, to resist the devil. Uh, this year has been something else, hasn't it? Um, it's very bizarre. I've heard it described as an ice age. Um, we're entering into an ice age. And that's uh, differentiated from, from a blizzard. You know, a blizzard comes for a time. Um, it, it gives a wallop of, of an impact, uh, but then it goes away. An ice age is a longer period, and, and nobody knows when it's going to end. And it's that uncertainty that's fueling all kinds of different things, including anxiety and some of the things that I mentioned before. But it's also empowering abusers. The statistics on abuse, coupled with statistics on depression and the suicide rates, are incredibly troubling. We need to be aware. We need to pay attention. The devil is hard at work. And if we fall asleep for even a second, if we don't keep vigilance, if we're not aware, if we're not willing to resist, the devil will win. But thank God we have Jesus Christ on our side, that we have hope, that we have each other, that we have Christians. And I hear this question a lot. People ask me, um, why did your dad do what he did? I said, for me, the important question is not so much why he did what he did. That's an endless abyss, and I think unless you can get inside his own mind, we'll never figure out why he did what he did, except that he wanted to. The important question for me is, how did he do what he did? Because if we understand something about how abusers are able to get away with what they do, and what it is about us that makes us susceptible, that makes us vulnerable to deception, until we figure that out, we're going to look like a bunch of bumbling idiots you know, trying to get through life, and abusers are going to run circles around us. They run marathons around us repeatedly. And I think part of what, part of what sparked um, my journey into research and trying to understand abusers was, first of all, starting with where I live. I grew up actually in Shanksville. Um, I, uh, that, that was a strip mine. It was an old strip mine where United 93 went down. I used to camp out there in the 90s when I was in high school. I would camp out on that property and I've stood on exact ground zero where, where the nose of that plane drove into the ground. And a little bit of history, and, and, and it's kind of interesting, at the 93 um, Memorial, if you've been there, 
when he walked down the, the pathway up to the museum that they have, the little memorial center, when you're walking on the pathway, there's a timeline on that pathway, and that pathway is pointed in the direction that the plane was flying. So that's the flight path. You're actually walking on the flight path. And my wife uh, asked me the other day when we were out there, we were visiting, she said, where's your mom's house in relation to where we're standing right now? We were literally standing on, on that pathway. And I said, if you draw a straight line on this trajectory through the woods, if you walk for one mile, you'll be standing on my mom's 23-acre property. One mile. If that plane would have landed one second later, it literally would have been on top of the house that I grew up in. But that day, people decided on that airplane, well, they didn't decide, they, 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 they used their brain, they talked to each other, they communicated, and they were able to recognize the deception. They were able to recognize that this was not a hijacking situation that was gonna land safely. Because that's what they were told. They were told by the hijackers, we've hijacked the airplane, if you cooperate, we'll, we'll return and we'll land safely. Well, they, they decided we're not going to take that at face value. We're not going to take what these people are saying at face value. We're going to research. We're going to dig. We're going to talk to family members. We're going to make some phone calls and figure out what's really going on. And through a series of phone calls, those passengers learned that three other airplanes had been driven on suicide missions into buildings. Two in the World Trade Centers and one into the Pentagon. And so those passengers decided that day to resist the devil. Tragically, they lost their lives, but that was a tipping point in this nation because it was a time where people stood up to evil and said, we will not bow down to evil. We will not let evil win. And so I've, I've been haunted from the time I found out by the fact that we all missed it. We missed it with my dad. James says, as I quoted, uh, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Jesus said that you will recognize uh, ravenous wolves by their fruit. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 15. He says it twice, which is really annoying. It was for a while. <laughs> because I thought, Jesus, what are you doing with me? We didn't recognize my dad by his fruits. We didn't see his fruits. We didn't know what fruits he was producing. And so that began this, this, this really dark journey of trying to get inside of my father's head because that was the only way that I could really figure out how evil works and how deception works. I had read every book that you can imagine, every book I could find on child sexual abuse, and there were big gaps in the research because it was all research that was coming from people sitting down with offenders who they didn't know, who were already locked up in prison, and they're asking them questions, and they're getting answers back, assuming that they're getting a straightforward answer. Let me tell you, that's not how deception works. Mm -hmm. These people do not ever tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And so the only way to get any piece of valuable information back was to really study my dad, and, and to know how to analyze his answers, and how to mm -hmm. manipulate him, and the questions I would ask him. And so I started this journey of, of cat and mouse with my dad, and eventually my dad caught on, and it became enticing to him. He actually enjoyed that there was a challenge where somebody could, could get ahead of him a little bit, and think the way he was thinking, and he could manipulate me, and I could manipulate, m manipulate him. And it was this bizarre game of cat and mouse over a period of years. And let me tell you, it is exhausting. But it's so important because I, I've not seen this level of research done where somebody is that close to an abuser, where somebody knows them really well and still has a relationship with them. So I've made that my journey. I'm gonna look at my slides here so I know when you guys can advance. So if you go to the next slide. Um, for me, it's really important to have this convergence of, of these really important fields. So we have um, psychology, where, which is where most of our research comes about deception and abusers and those sorts of things. Um, praxis is um, how these guys actually operate. 
Because it's a lot different to read something on paper and actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an abuser. And any of you who have ever been fooled or manipulated or tricked or deceived, you know how smooth these people are. You know how good they are at looking you in the eyes and pulling all the right heartstrings and making you think, my goodness, what a great person. Mm -hmm. Right? I was listening on my way here this morning. I was listening to the radio, and there's a survey, and I don't know how, how reputable it is or how big, how widespread this uh, survey is, but they did the survey, and they said, we asked women, what are you looking for in a man? What are you looking for in a partner? 84% of the answers came back from these women, and they said, we're looking for kindness. That was interesting to me, and I perked up, and I thought, kindness. Kindness is not a disposition. Kindness is a discipline. And it's a discipline that abusers know how to, how to be disciplined really well. They know how to be kind to people. And I think that's part of the problem. When we're looking for abusive people, we're looking for abusive patterns, we're looking for somebody who's unkind. And we think to ourselves, if something's going on right under my nose, I would be the first to know it. Right? Not so sure anymore. Because I know how abusers think, and I know how they exploit kindness and our expectations. Today I'm going to be talking about expectations. <laughs> and how abusers exploit our expectations. Science, it's really important that we pull science into this equation. There are very scientific um, methods behind the techniques that abusers use. Much like magicians, um, I started reading letters from my dad from prison, I was like, what he's describing, and how he gained access to his victims, and how he abused people, and how he deceived us, and how he created this whole world separate from, from who he really was. He created this facade, and he lived in that facade for over four decades. By the way, he confessed to over 23 victims. We think he had well into the hundreds. He was able to do that because he was using techniques very similar to what magicians do. And by the way, if you've ever watched a stage magician, right, they're good. They're good at what they do. They're good at deception. And there's a reason for that. There's a scientific reason for that. So we need to tap the scientific community. I've done that. Theology. I challenge you to find books that are written by theologians or pastors or, or people who really use the scripture as their foundation, I challenge you to find books on deception and abuse and the methods that abusers use and how we can resist the devil. I challenge you to find them. You'll come up empty-handed. There's a handful out there, kind of. But people in the Christian communities are not talking about abuse still, at least not in a meaningful, impactful way. Instead, we hear things like, well, you know, we need to be a place that's open to everybody. We need to welcome everybody, no matter what they've done. We need to give people the benefit of the doubt. When people say that, that they come in as a visitor and they are who they say they are, who are we to question them? I, I would argue very strongly from the Bible. That is not a biblical method for recognizing deception. There are plenty of scriptures that, that differentiate between, between us, between people, sinners who struggle, who wrestle. We all know what that's like, right? I hope we know what that's like. If, if we have flesh, we know what it's like to live in the flesh. We know what it's like to be tempted. We know what it's like to have our own demons and to struggle. We know what that's like to wrestle. But the scriptures differentiate between people like you and I and people who revel in the daytime, as Peter says. 2 Peter 2. And, and there's, there's, a, there's a very clear difference in how to treat people who are wrestling with sin and people who masquerade as children of light in order to steal away and deceive and take what they want.
Over and over and over and over again, the scriptures say things like, have nothing to do with them. Those are Paul's words in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul also says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, he says, while evil people and imposters will go on from, listen, from bad to worse. Mm -hmm. Deceiving and being deceived, self-deception. They don't get better, they get worse. Why? Because deception is enticing. It's different than what you and I struggle with. It's different than us struggling and having guilt and shame and feeling that weight on our shoulders and, and trying to hide sin for a while. And eventually what happens? There's this, there's this dam that builds up inside of us and eventually that dam bursts and what do we have to do? We confess. Abusers don't do that. They only take the deception deeper and deeper and deeper. And there's this, there's this pathway that James describes when he says each one of us is tempted. When we give in to our own desire, and then that desire conceives and it gives birth to sin, and then there's more desire, there's more temptation, and then eventually James lays this, this pathway out, and he says, and eventually it leads to death. I believe he's talking about spiritual death. And there's this pathway where if, if you get to this point where it becomes so enticing that, that you can't see clearly anymore. My dad, by the way, thinks he is absolutely right with God, and he believed that from the time he was arrested. The problem was not with him, the problem was with us. That his love was genuine for these kids. Sure, he did some things that, that were bad, he said, but don't we all have skeletons in our own closet? Those were the kinds of arguments that he was creating. I went and read some of the reports of the things that my father had done to his victims, and I, I part of me regrets that I did it, but the other part of me had to see it with my own eyes, because what he was telling me he did to his victims wasn't even in the same universe as what he actually did to his victims. And I'm here to tell you, after consulting with dozens and dozens and dozens of churches, after doing trainings with police departments, with the military, in schools, in churches, across the country and across the globe, I'm here to tell you that 100% of the time, deceivers will lie about the degree to which they abused, if they even tell you at all, 100% of the time. So we need to converge these different groups together and really think through this and process. Okay, if you go to the next one. Um, I discovered this book kind of, um, kind of accidentally, but I was really looking for somebody who was, who was describing, as a scientist, um, abuse techniques that looked like what magicians were doing. And I know it sounds like a strange combination, but I'm telling you, the more I read my, my dad's letters from prison, I was like, the techniques that he's describing, I would ask him really specific questions. Because he, he casually just kind of put it out there that, oh, by the way, I abused my victims right in front of you guys. And I did it a lot. And I'm not talking little subtle things, I'm talking full on penetration of victims with fingers and things like that right in front of us while he was having casual conversation with us. And I started reading his letters and I would ask him very specific questions about techniques. And what he was writing back sounded so similar, so similar to what magicians do, right? And I, I started thinking about the question, if, if they know what they're doing is illegal, if they know what they're doing is gonna land them in prison forever, most likely, if they get caught, it's, it's fairly simple to take a child and isolate the child and abuse that child in, in, in private and threaten the child or do whatever it is to keep the child silent. So why are abusers, and lots of them, I would argue most if not all of them, are at some point abusing their victims right in front of us, right under our noses? The question is, why would you risk it? Why would you risk it? Why would you intentionally abuse these children right in front of their parents, 
right in front of the caretakers, right in church while they're sitting worshiping and people are praying. And by the way, I don't ever pray with my eyes closed. I used to. I don't anymore. You know what I do when people are praying? I watch. I look around the room. I look where people's hands are in relation to children. I watch because I know what abusers do and when they do it. So the question is, why, why would you risk it? Here's the answer, because they want to. James described, or sorry, Peter described it really well in 2 Peter chapter two. I'm not gonna read it now. Um, if we have time with the Q and A, um, I wanna look at a bunch of scriptures. So I found this book, kind of by accident. It's by two neuroscientists, uh, Dr. Stephen Macknick and his wife, Susanna martinez Conde. It's called Slights of Mind, What the Neuroscience of Magic Reveals About Our Everyday Deceptions. The title caught my attention. When I read the book, it really caught my attention. And I thought, this, this is exactly, this is a blueprint for what my dad is, is writing and describing. If I could juxtapose my dad's letters with this book, there's almost a direct correlation. And I contacted Dr. Magnick, Drs. Magnick and Martinez Conde, and I told them about some of the research that I was doing, how I was applying their research to the field of pedophilia. They were intrigued. Um, and it's on my website. We ended up doing a, a, a workshop together, a training workshop for our local police department. They came to Somerset from New York City and we did a, a presentation together on deception techniques and how there are these parallels to abusers. And, and there's this wide open field that's never been researched before. And we're starting to tap into that. Uh, if you go to the next slide, this, this quote from them, uh, from their book, really gripped me. The spooky truth is that your brain constitutes reality, visual or otherwise. What you see, hear, feel, and think is based on what you expect to see, hear, feel, and think. In turn, your expectations are based on all your prior experiences and memories. This was groundbreaking for me. This was the uh, holy grail for me. Because I had never thought about that before. If you really think about it, everything that we think, and science backs us up, science can prove this, science shows us, Everything that we experience in life, everything we feel, everything we think we know, everything that we see, is not reality. And I did, I think when I was in West Nyack, I did this um, last year, but Stephen and Susanna, who, who, who study visual science, visual, uh, they're visual scientists, they said if you hold your right hand out, you guys can go ahead and do it, hold your right hand out, and look at your thumbnail. Your spotlight of attention is the size of that thumbnail. Do you see how I'm blurry? If you look up at me and, and keep looking at your thumbnail, do you see how I'm blurry? That's reality. Anything past your hand, we're legally blind. We're legally blind, whether you wear glasses or not. Anything past your hand, we're legally blind. And to make things even more scary, our spotlight of attention, what we can actually focus on and see, is the size of our thumbnail, literally. So your brain is constructing this clear vision with all these magnificent colors that pop out and, and what I look like, what you guys are seeing right now is your brain's construction of a reality that doesn't exist. But it's based on when you guys passed by me, when we were closer, and you got to look at me. Your brain remembers these things and is constantly making these shortcuts. So it's fascinating things, but it's not just visual reality. It's your emotions. It's, it's the way we feel about people, the gut feelings that we get. Now, a lot of that's accurate, but, but some of that's just based on past experiences. Uh, we, have a, we have a service dog who's sitting here. Some of you may be scared of the, the, the dog. Others of us, you know, your dog came up and was sniffing me because, uh, yeah. because of my animals. <laughs> and, and I was perfectly fine with the dog. And I know, you know, service dogs, you don't pet. So, you know, I don't pet service dogs. 
Um, but other people may, you know, come up, and I'm sure you'll experience that. People are messing with your dog and getting down on the ground, and, and you have to remind them, this is a service dog. Other people are terrified and don't want anything to do with the dog. Why is that? It's the same dog. Very different reactions to the dog. It's based on our experiences. And that becomes our reality. It's not that people are faking being scared of dogs or that people are faking being not scared of dogs. It's that our reality is shaped on our past experiences. And by the way, abusers know this. I'm going to give you um, this next uh, slide. I'm going to give you something that... Do you guys remember this little satanic thing? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and play. How many people who? How many people have heard this, first of all? Real? Oh, we have some new blood. A lot of new blood here. Okay. Yummy. 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 Laurel. 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 Okay, what do you guys hear? Yeah, Laurel. You have old ears, John. <laughs> and, and my wife could only hear Laurel, and she thought I was messing with her. And she's like, "Does it sound like? Does it sound like? Uh, like Laurel Yanny?" I was like, "No, it is Yanny." She said, "No, it is a Laurel." So that's that's kind of an odd, you know, one one that's audio. What about visual? Just to show you that our brains. Don't really see what's actually there. Um, show the next slide. Remember this little gem? Yeah. How many people see blue and black? How many people see a white dress with gold trim? Look, about 50%. About half of you. So, we are looking at the same image, are we not? Right? I'm not tricking you. We're not looking at two different two different slides. This is the same exact photo, and we're looking at it. And your brain is constructing something that's that's not reality. How about the next one? Remember this little thing too that created a lot of division in marriages. A lot of counselors are capitalizing on this one. What color is it? How many people see blue laces and, and you know blue? A strip and kind of a pinkish shoe. How many people see blue laces? Blue, now that you said shoe. pink, I'm starting to see the pink. Color. Yeah. So you deceive her, you? How many people see the shoelaces on this as, as pure white? Now I do. So about again about split 50-50. And I see about half of you are afraid to raise your hand one way or the other. You're wise. So. Um, these are these are really interesting things because it shows right in real time, right, that your brain is making all kinds of stuff up. And what's interesting is what what they said about the sound is that when you introduce ambiguity, your brain doesn't know what to do with that. Our brains want to be black and white thinkers, so we want to take things at face value. If somebody says. Yes, we want to believe they mean yes. If somebody says no, we want to believe that they actually mean no. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. The reality is there are deceptive people out there who, who blur the answers. And, and when our brain has any form of ambiguity introduced, whether it be visual, audio, um, emotionally, spiritually even, our brain doesn't know what to do with that, so it just starts making things up. And it, it, it pieces things together the way it thinks they ought to be, the, the way that makes sense in your brain's world, um, but it's not reality. So what, what's happening here is that these are in really ambiguous lighting situations. The, the blue dress, by the way, is actually blue. Um, but probably not the blue that we're seeing, 
Uh, it's probably very different than what our eyes are seeing it. But that dress was sitting, the, the story of this is pretty cool, that dress was sitting in a display window. So it was getting natural light from the outside, but there was a, a spotlight above the dress to kind of highlight the dress. So it created this ambiguous lighting situation. And this bride-to-be snapped a picture of it, sends it to her mom, and she says, Mom, do you like this blue dress? Her mom responded back and said, What blue dress? And so she started texting, thought, thinking her mom was messing with her, and she's like, The one that I just sent you in the picture. She said, You didn't send me a picture of a blue dress. You sent me a picture of a white dress, and yeah, I like it. Uh, so she uploaded it to the internet, and the internet practically broke, uh, as did a lot of marriages <laughs> over that one. Um, and so the shoe came up too. And, and the shoe, I think, is actually, I think, um, I'm going to say this because, because, because I think I'm right. I, <laughs> actually, I don't remember the answer. I think that the shoe is actually a, a pinkish shoe with blue shoelaces and blue stripes. I think that's the right answer. I'm not positive. Um, I'm getting booed. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> yeah, I knew somebody would agree with me. Uh, it's amazing, isn't it? There's, there's science behind this, and here's the thing. Abusers know what your expectations are. They also know how to introduce ambiguity, and, and by doing so, they know how to shift your brain to allow your brain to see the things or not to see things that are going on right in front of it. That's how magicians make a living. Magicians don't walk on the stage and they're not sheepishly like, I hope I get away with it this time, right? <laughs> they know. They know how your brain is going to respond because it's just science. And how do they, how do, they do it with such confidence and, and, and with such finesse? They rehearse. They practice over and over and over and over and over again. And this is no different for abusers. Abusers are constantly testing us and they, they know what our expectations are because they talk to us. And what your expectations are, or my expect, and my expectations, they're going to be two different things. And so abusers know how to be very specific in who they target and who they fool and how they fool them and what techniques they use for this person versus this person. And it's not just about finding a child that they're attracted to and then, oh my goodness, they can't control themselves and, and, and they let the, you know, the best get of them uh, and, and they just fall into temptation. It doesn't work that way. I'm here to tell you it doesn't work that way. Ever. They know exactly what the end goal is, and they know how they're going to get there based on your expectations. And when we hear about vulnerabilities as being, you know, the kid in the raggedy clothes living in a ditch under a bridge somewhere, uh, or who has an unloving home and unloving parents, and if you just love your kids more and provide a stable home, your kids won't be vulnerable. Baloney. It does not work that way. All of us are vulnerable. All of us are vulnerable just in different ways. Vulnerable, vulnerability doesn't mean weakness. Vulnerability just means there's a way, there's a crack somewhere inside of us, inside of our, our, our ability to uh, acknowledge deception, inside of our ability to love people back. And there's a crack somewhere, and abuser's gonna find that crack, and they're gonna get in. They're gonna find a way in. They're gonna find that, that little crack and they're going to worm their way in. It's what they do. Okay, next slide. Uh, so Rachel Denhollander, um, she was abused uh, along with hundreds of other victims right in front of uh, her parents in Larry Nassar's office. Larry Nassar, the U.S. Uh, doctor. Rachel Denhollander was the one who came forward publicly and eventually that led to Larry Nassar's demise. Uh, so here's a quote from an article. For years, Den Hollander said, she'd been studying pelvic floor manipulation to confirm her suspicions that what Nassar had done to her wasn't medical. Now how did she, why did, why did she have to wrestle with this? Was what was, she knew she could feel it was gross, it was dirty, it wasn't right as a girl. She knew it wasn't right. Her body told her it wasn't right, but her brain was a little bit behind, wasn't it, why? 
Because her expectations, even as a child, is that when you go into a doctor's office, a doctor's going to be professional. And by the way, he's nice. He's laughing. He's cracking jokes. The expectation is that nothing bad is going to happen. Guess who else knew what Rachel's expectations were? And guess who exploited those expectations? And it wasn't just her, it was her mom. So she, uh, Rachel reviewed uh, Nasser's training videos and PowerPoint presentations with the MSU investigators, pointing out where Nasser would have had the same hand placement during her appointments with him, so her mother would have been able to see the external massage, but not that Nasser's other hand was under the towel, penetrating her vagina and or rectum, the report says. What he is showing in those videos is legitimate, but what he was doing to me was not, Devin Hollander told police. Those same videos and presentations had been critical in helping Nasser elude criminal charges in 2014, when graduate student Amanda Thomashow reported Nasser massaging her vagina and breast during an exam. So in 2014, Nasser was in, he was interviewed for two hours. You can find this interview with the police on YouTube. And you can see how the police are taken in by him. They're like, wow. Like, he gets his laptop out, and he's showing presentations, and he's like, yeah, but he's like, I don't know where this is coming from. Here's what I'm doing. I'm a renowned doctor. I teach this stuff around the world. I do presentations on pelvic floor techniques. By the way, Larry Nasser was never certified in pelvic floor techniques. You know how he found out about pelvic floor techniques that he used on every one of his victims? He did Google searches. He's touting himself as a world-renowned doctor, and he's on pelvic floor techniques. He was the guy in the world who knew pelvic floor techniques. How did he get away with it? People never asked him if he was certified. Their expectation was that here's a renowned doctor, here's a kind guy, here's a respectable doctor. He's working with U.S. Olympic kids. He's an Olympic doctor. He would never falsify information. That's our expectations, but the reality was much different, wasn't it? Uh, the, next, the next slide comes from another article. Second, it hit McCall that not only had her daughter been abused, but she, McCall, had been sitting just a few feet away the entire time, chatting politely. I wasn't somebody with, like, my nose in the phone, McCall says. I was having conversations with them. And whenever Larry, <clears throat> whenever Larry was doing something in that pelvic area, I would go up and stand by the table because I wanted her to feel more comfortable. So it's not like Larry Nasser, when mom came up and stood beside him, it's not like he was like, oh no, what do I do now? You know what he did? Come on up, help her, help her feel more comfortable. Did he stop what he was doing? No. Why? Because he knew exactly what the mom was seeing or not seeing based on science, based on practice, based on experience, based on a host of things. This is how deception works. McCall says then Nasser would often have Morgan lay on her stomach while he leaned over to massage her back with his forearm, like if you're giving somebody a, a hard massage, a really hard massage, she says. McCall assumed he was using his other arm. You, do you hear a word that really sticks out? Yeah, she assumed he was using his other arm to brace against the table. I couldn't see that part of it. Listen to this. This will give you chills. But I had no reason to question it either. Except that she did. But her brain told her, yeah, he must be propping, must be propping his weight up with that arm. Why? Because of expectations. You don't expect a doctor, especially if mama bear is standing by her little cub, right? All you mamas and dads, for that matter. Nobody would ever touch my kid if I was standing right there. I'm going to be that present parent. I'm going to be there with my kid. I'm going to be at all the events. I'm going to keep watch even. And they're running marathons around you. Next slide. Uh, this was another parent. 
She says she was fully covered, even wearing running shorts. I, unlike others, don't remember him blocking my view since she was covered. Uh, but since she was covered, I was unaware of what he was doing under the sheet. After he was done, he washed his hands, and I remember thinking, did he just do what I think he did? Where are his gloves? Okay, so she, she's thinking this. Did he, really, did he do what I just thought he did? Enter ambiguity, right? Whole lot of ambiguity. By the way, Larry knows this. I immediately dismissed the thoughts as there must have been some good reason. This was Larry, after all. No need to question him. I trusted him. We all trusted him. The crazy thing about all this, in our situation anyway, is the treatment really did help. My daughter went from barely being able to walk to being nearly pain-free. He had done it again. He helped us in what was otherwise a very concerning injury. These treatments went on for six months. No questions, no concerns. That is until September of 2016. The news broke in a story published by IndyStar that there were accusations of sexual abuse against Dr. Nasser, our Dr. Nasser. This started coming out. Stories that were eerily similar to ours. Confusion began to cloud us. But it was treatment. Or was it? How could it not be? It helped. We couldn't wrap our heads around it. I couldn't fathom that this could even be possibly true. I mean, I was in the room. Pop quiz for you. What is her brain doing? It's filling in the gaps, isn't it? It's creating a reality that was not reality. <clears throat> I was in the room. I was standing right there. No, not, not our doctor. Not my daughter. I was right there. I was standing beside him. There's no way he could do that to my daughter. No. Not a chance. And abusers know this. She said, did I let someone assault my daughter in front of my very eyes? Never would I allow it to happen. My children are my world, and anyone who knows me knows that about me. So how could this have happened? I'm here to tell you how. See, that, that's not a rhetorical question, by the way. She's genuinely asking, <coughs> how did this happen? Um, we're going to skip the next slide. If, if you guys, um, <coughs> just for time's sake, if you guys go online, uh, look at the Larry Nasser uh, interview from 2016, much different than the 2014 interview. In 2016, I was going to show a couple clips from this, but, but just watch the first two minutes, because it's pretty hard to stomach. And uh, it, it's just, it, it's tough to watch. But in the first two minutes, Larry Nasser appeals, I think it's six different times to the fact that he was in the same room with the parents. That I, I just don't, I, he's, at one point he says, this just hurts my heart. I don't understand where these accusations are coming from. I had assistants in the room. I had parents in the room. There, there was always somebody in the room, or at least I tried to always have somebody in the room. He keeps appealing to that. Why? <coughs> because he knows our expectations. Well, if somebody was in the room, especially one of his assistants who knows what to watch for, maybe this was a misunderstanding. Maybe Rachel didn't really know what was happening to her. So he's appealing to that. It didn't work, fortunately. But it worked for decades. I have letters from my dad describing in detail how he thinks in all these different scenarios if somebody starts, starts catching on. And he says, I never worried. I never worried that I was going to get caught. Because if, if somebody, even if they suspected, even if parents suspected that I was doing something to their kids, here's the route that I would take. I would go down this road. I would say this to them. I would, I would reassure them. I would go this route. And it's all about technique. It's all about introducing ambiguity and then redirecting the brain where you want the brain to go, holding that spotlight of attention. It's what magicians do. Uh, the next slide we will show, um, these guys know where to start. This is Lili Lang. Um, she's the fourth and newest president of USA Gymnastics. Uh, she was a patient of Larry Nasser, and she knows what it takes to keep these girls safe. You can sense my sarcasm. Listen to what she says. 
I was seen by Larry Nasser myself. You were? Um, I was, but I was not abused by him. And the reason why I wasn't abused by him is because my coach was by my side when he saw me. I was seen by him in a public setting. And so I understand what the setting needs to be like in order to ensure safety for our athletes. Wow. How do you think that? Uh, by the way, I, I just um, did a podcast. I interviewed um, Judge Aquilina, who's incredible. I had her on the podcast a, a few weeks ago. She said, do you know that, that Larry's up to now over 600 victims that we know of? 600. Over 600. Yeah, yeah, I, I was seen by Larry. I... And I wasn't abused because somebody was there in the room with me. I know what it takes. So I know what it takes to keep these girls safe. Next slide. Let's see how how some of the victims responded to that. Rachel says, uh, this, "It's hard to see. I'll, I'll I'll read it." But Rachel Van Hollander put a tweet out. She said, "Same here. He talked to my mom about my science homework. Abhorrent lack of knowledge, not just of USAG's situation, but abuse dynamics in general." Um, okay, next slide. Also, Rachel Dan Hollander, she says this about covers it. USAG's new president says Larry Nasser never abused her because her coach was in the room. So she, quote unquote, understands preventing abuse. <laughs> Except most abuse happened with a parent or coach in the room. She understands precisely nothing after two plus years. Not acceptable. Um, next slide, this is uh, Lindsay Lemke. She said, John Getter was by our sides and saw us get sexually abused by him and did nothing about it, so it doesn't matter who's by your side. Hate to break it to you. Uh, by the way, this is interesting to me for a whole lot of reasons, but you can see how victims, their perspective is that somebody was in the room they saw it, and they just didn't care. The number of survivors who I've spoken to, when I talk about, I specialize in, in abuse in plain sight. That's where I've settled in on, on my research, abuse in plain sight and deception techniques. <clears throat> the amount of survivors who have come to me, even in their 70s, one lady chased me through a parking lot. I was walking out to my, to my car to leave for the day after I had done a training. She chased me down in the parking lot. She's an elderly woman. She said, I need to tell you how much you freed me today. My entire life, up until my parents' death, I resented them with every ounce of everything that's inside of me. Because I said, how could you sit there and watch me be abused over and over and over again, and you did nothing about it? And she said, it wasn't until today that I realized it wasn't that my parents saw it and didn't do anything, it's that they never saw it in the first place. That had never crossed her mind in over 70 years of her life. That had never crossed her mind that this abuser was using highly sophisticated techniques to keep the abuse hidden so that he was full on abusing her right in front of her parents and they didn't see it. That's why this is important. But you can see that with, with Lindsay. In her mind, she's, you know, she's feeling, which is natural, it's, it, it's, that's naturally the way the human brain is wired. How could you stand here, especially as a kid, that's how they're wired. They're black and white, very concrete thinkers. How could you, how could you stand here, John Getter, and watch this happen to me and you did nothing about it? I'm not so convinced that John Getter saw it. I'm not saying that he's innocent. I know enough about him that he did turn a blind eye at other points. Uh, the next slide, uh, Ali Raisman. Suggesting that athlete safety can be achieved by, uh, simply by requiring coaches or parents to be present and changing the setting of medical treatment is misleading and dangerous. Fixing the problem requires an understanding that can come only from a full and independent investigation. In other words, she wants to know, how did this happen? We need, a, we need an independent investigation to get behind the nuts and the bolts of how this happened in front of all these people. And everybody missed it. <clears throat> So the next slide, um, abusers exploit the following. 
Um, if I could kind of boil this down and just generalize this. First of all, they exploit our spotlight of attention. Remember that little thumbnail sized thing in front of us? That's our spotlight of attention. Everything outside of that, um, we don't really have a full awareness of what's going on. Subconsciously, yeah, kind of, but not with, not with precision, not with accuracy. So if somebody can grab a hold of our spotlight of attention and pull it around, which is not hard to do, especially when you learn, they can do all kinds of things all around us and we'll never know it. And they do this through hacking our belief system, expectations, what do we believe about grace? What do we believe about mercy? What do we believe about second chances? What do we believe about visitors coming in and, and just you know, letting them come in? What do we believe about our hiring processes? Is it really fair to sit down and grill people with all these unnecessary questions or should we just look at their kindness and hire them because, because they're gen they're really, they seem really sincere. Do we ever say that? All of us have done that before. He seemed really sincere or she seemed really sincere. You know, my response is, <laughs> so what? I can seem all kinds of things and that may not be reality. Uh, they, they exploit our emotions. Both good and bad. Make you laugh. Make people laugh at the right times. Make them cry at the right times. Give a touch on the shoulder at the right time. Console somebody at the right time. Emotions are a powerful thing that gets our brain in hyperdrive and it starts creating all these, all these realities based on what? Our experiences. What we expect to happen. It's kind of interesting, and I, I think I talked about this too last year. Uh, if not, I've talked about it other places, but I started looking at our governor's website uh, where they put out uh, the, the annual report on child abuse in Pennsylvania. And one of the things that I noticed is that there's, there's a really big skewing in the numbers of mandated reporters, and, it, and it's really disproportionate, where a lot of the people reporting, a lot of the mandated reporters who are reporting, are not school teachers or pastors or caseworkers or people like that. You know who it is? Funeral directors. What's kind of interesting to me is that it didn't surprise me. Based on the amount of people who I talk to across the country, when I speak at churches and different places and they say, yeah, I was, I was groped, I was felt up while I was standing at the casket looking over my dead loved one. Oh, it's common. Elders, deacons, people, leaders from the church, pastors, they come up and it looks like a consultation. Why are, why are people not seeing it? Expectations. We expect that when the pastor is coming through line and he's, and he's hugging somebody, that it's just an embrace. It's just a, it's a comforting embrace to say, I'm sorry. Not so fast. And then, of course, uh, narrative, just painting the, you know, spinning the right web, and then visual illusions. Okay, if you go to the next one, uh, I did this little fun thing last year, and this was uh, first shown to me by Stephen and Susanna, Drs. Macnick and Martinez Conde, and they give, gave me permission to use this in presentations, but this is the first time ever that they could actually in real time, show how your brain, the spotlight of attention is being pulled all over the place. So if you look at that, and you look at the little blue circle in the middle, it might be hard to see for some of you in the back, but right in the center, there's a little blue circle. And it is blue, by the way. <laughs> if you look at that little blue circle and just focus your attention on that, you'll notice that the top right circle becomes a little bit more dominant, right? It kind of stands out, gets a little bit more bright. Or is it the bottom circle that becomes more dominant? Or is it the top left circle that begins to poke out and become more dominant? Or wait a second, wasn't it the bottom circle again? Or no, we started with the top right circle that's more dominant. All this stuff about grooming and, you know, abusers spend years grooming their victims and, and they, you know, they 
they start building trust over time. Some of that stuff is true, but you know what? Did I groom you just now? No. Did I force you into doing anything? Did I manipulate you into anything? Well, kind of, but... <laughs> but, but that was your brain doing that. That wasn't me getting inside your head and you know, steering you in this different direction. It's just knowing the science about how our spotlight of attention works. And using a little bit of narrative, I was able to show you how your brain, hey, I'm, I'm going to walk in the room and I'm just going to be aware. I'm just going to pay attention and nothing will get by me. We have, how many times do I hear this? We have police officers in our church buildings and they, they're, you know, you know, they're keeping watch. When I train police departments and I show this, their jaws are on the floor and they're like, how dare you? <laughs> yeah, right? Because they're trained to watch people. They're trained to always be on alert. And they are to a degree, but if you know how to exploit people, it's easy to find their vulnerabilities. So rethinking the way that we, the way that we view people and, and, and realizing we're not as perceptive as we think we are. So for Jimmy Hinton to, to, to be the sole person or to say, our leaders are going to keep an eye out. My question to them, to those churches who say, well, we, you know, shh, we, have, we have an abuser here, but the church doesn't know it. So if you keep that quiet, shh, but don't worry because our leaders are on it. My question is, who else in addition to your leaders? And it better be every living, breathing person who's inside of that congregation, because that's how many people it takes. Even when you're trained really well, it takes that many people to keep watch. Having a handful of leaders keeping watch over your flock is not enough. I promise you it's not enough. These guys are running marathons around us. Uh, next slide. Abusers exploit our belief system. Uh, this is from Dr. Anna Salter's book, Predators. Um, excellent, excellent book. If you've not read it, it is a must-read for every pastor, every church leader. It's a must-read. Uh, this was an interview with, um, with an abuser. Uh, he had 53 victims. He was the youngest Methodist deacon in the state of Alabama at the time of his arrest. He said, I consider people that go to church gullible because they have a trust that comes from being Christians. They seem to want to believe in the good that exists in all people. Because of that, it was easy for me to convince them. Because of that, you can convince them with or without convincing words. You don't need convincing words to, to fool people. Yeah, church people, they're especially gullible. You just go in, you know what to do. Bam, bam. Go in, you do the job, you get out, and they don't have a clue. Then this other one, uh, another guy said, um, I think people are very easy to fool. Dr. Anna Salter asked, why do, you, why do you think they're so easy to fool? He says, because they want to believe in something. They want to hope, and they want to believe. There's something inside of people that makes them want to believe the best in things, and the best in others, because the alternative is not very nice. So how do abusers know that what they're doing uh, um, is, is going to be successful and that they're, they're going to get away with it and that you're not going to be on to them and you're not going to figure it out? They just know. They don't really care about the science. I don't think they're cracking open science books and you know, they're not studying deception and all this stuff. They just know. They just know. And understanding deception and really digging into the scriptures I think we have to come with a different lens and we have to say, okay, people may not be who they appear to be on the outside, and by the way, that's very biblical. When Jesus talks about wolves, and he's not the only one, and he does it often. When he talks about wolves, he's not describing what they do. He's not describing their behavior. He's describing who they are. He could have used different terminology. He could have said, you know, bad people. Some people are really bad. They do really bad things. He didn't say that. He describes them in these really visceral, uh, visual terms where he described them as wolves. 
And by the way, never, ever, ever in the context of the Bible anywhere, when it talks about wolves, does it talk about compassion? Does it talk about um, giving them community? Does it talk about being gentle with them, restoring them, um, leading them to the cross, offering grace? It's never in the context, always in the context, though, are things like be aware, keep watch. The good shepherd does what? Lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand does what? He runs away. Yeah, when the, wolves are, when the wolf comes in and, and starts attacking sheep in the sheep pen, the wolf is hightailing it out of there. Why? Because he cares nothing for the sheep. So Jesus' message in John chapter 10 is, in, so therefore, open up the sheep pen to all. Can you imagine that being our conclusion? But we conclude that over and over and over. I speak at churches all over the place, and they're like, yes, but, but how can we tell the you know, people that they're not welcome at the church? And I say, like this, you're not welcome at this church. <laughs> I mean, if, but I'm not saying, I'm not saying, like, find somebody who's, you know, find somebody who has this dark secret and this dark sin or this addiction that they're battling and kick them out. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we need to differentiate between people who wrestle with sin. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul says that we need to gently restore those who are, what, caught in a sin. It's a soft term that Paul uses. Or somebody gets entrapped, and, and they get lured in, and they're slowly kind of pulled into that. And before they know it, they're like, how did I get here? You know what Paul describes for, for people like that who wrestle, who have, who have these kind of demons that, that you know, they wrestle with? And, and they just get to this point where they're like, how, how did I get here? You know what Paul's response is? Restore them gently. You know, his response is when people are intentionally deceiving others for their own personal gain. have nothing to do with them. Why? Because they don't get better, they get worse. They love deceiving people and being deceived. It's this deception and self-deception and it's this cycle and it's cyclical and it's, 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 um, it's intentional and they know exactly what they're doing and, and people say, well, how do you know that? Well, first of all, the Bible says so. Second, um, I, I challenge anybody to take somebody who's been performing magic for their whole lives and tell them to just shut their brain off. Don't think about magic. Don't think about deception. Don't think about your next, you know, your next trick and how you're going to take it to the next level. Just stop thinking about it. They can't not think about it. I think you're allowed to use double negatives in that circumstance. They can't not think about it, right? Um, I can't shut my brain off. I think in terms of deception, in recognizing deception. I can't just be like, you know, my wife's told me, why don't you just stop thinking about it? I can't. It consumes me in a good way. I think about it because once, once you learn to think that way, you can't unthink about deception. It's part of your DNA. It's part of who you are. And so for people who are using deception to hurt other people and to steal away what they want, they can't stop. It's not about addiction. It's not about wrestling with sin. It's about who they are. And that's why Jesus says, you will recognize them by their fruits. The fruit that they produce, ironically, looks like fruit that you and I produce. <clears throat> And so at face value, if we're taking people at face value, we're like, but look at all the good that they're doing. Yeah. Kids just seem to flock to them, right? We hear that a lot about abusers. They're so kind, they're so generous. They are, they're kind, they're generous. They're giving, they're loving, they're doing all these things. But it's not until we take that fruit and we dissect it and we open it up to look what's on the inside that we recognize what kind of fruit it actually is. And to do that, you need to know something about deception and how people think and how they process and what their motives are and, and, and those sorts of things. So anyway, I could talk forever and, and, and you probably have all kinds of questions. So um, I want to open this up now uh, so that you guys can have questions and then 
uh, we will we will consume some food after.